okay, for anything like me, you've probably been kept up at night wondering why softer running shoes lead to higher impact forces than we're running than stiffer running shoes. It just doesn't make sense. Well, prepare to sleep like a baby because I came across an article on Outside Online and it's by Alex Hutchinson, so you know it's good. And it's titled Untangling Running's Shoe Cushioning Paradox. And when I see untangling paradoxes in a title, you have my full attention. Oh, and also for the acutely observant of you, you can see I have a few props sitting right here on my desk. I will be using those very shortly and then I will be removing these disgusting shoes from my desk. Oh, but also this is the weekly running and training vlog where the main purpose of this video is for you to tell me about your week of running. I want to hear about your successes and I definitely want to hear about those setbacks. But first, let's get into that paradoxical untangling. So yes, it's true. It has been found that impact forces are greater in softer running shoes than in stiffer running shoes. And that's the paradox that we're going to get into today because we have figured out why. And I guess I'll tell you right off the bat that Ultimately, it isn't true. Well, it is true, but it isn't true. How's that for a hook to keep you from going to the next video? Okay, so this Outside Online article references a study published in the European Journal of Sports Science. And it was published earlier this year, so we know it's good. All new stuff is good, right? And this study that was conducted was, was actually pretty good. When we're looking to draw accurate conclusions from an experiment, we have to randomize. And we all know that double-blind studies are the gold standard. And here's the thing. When we're testing running shoes, and you and I are in a lab, let's just say it's a very small experiment where it's only you and I. And I am given a pair of Birkenstocks. And they tell me, Matt, jump on the treadmill, run for a couple of miles and let me know how you feel. And then I want you to take these Birkenstocks and go away for six months and come back, see if you're injured. Okay. Then imagine you are given a pair of these Austin 10s. Probably could have chosen a newer shoe, but this was the first thing I grabbed in my garage. Anyway, that's beside the point. Let's say that you were given a pair of these Boston 10s and look at this. We have, oh, we've got a nice bit of cushioning here. It's really thick in the heel. It's thick in the forefoot. This is going to be a comfy shoe. And you're told by the researchers, jump on a treadmill, go for a run. Then take this pair of shoes, come back in six months. Let's see if you're injured. At this stage, I'm wishing I were you. I'm not looking forward to six months of running in Birkenstocks. So this creates some obvious issues, right? I go away and even if these are the most comfortable sandals, I am probably thinking to myself, oh, this, I'm going to get injured wearing these. And I'll go out and I run my average mileage. And you know what? If I ran for six months in a pair of Birkenstocks, I probably would develop some kind of injury. And even if I didn't, I would probably attribute any aches and pains I got to running in a totally inappropriate shoe. Whereas you, you, you're happy. You're running in a well-designed running shoe, plenty of cushioning, not really a fair experiment. Okay, let me get those out of the way now. Brush this junk off my desk. So here's how the researchers tackled this conundrum. They went to Decathlon. Decathlon is a huge sports manufacturer in France, and they had Decathlon manufacture identical running shoes for the participants of their study. Now these running shoes looked exactly the same. They had a 34 millimeter stack height in the heel and they had a 10 millimeter drop. And here's the beauty. All Decathlon did was to alter the chemistry of the EVA foam in the midsole and they made half the shoes soft running shoes and half the shoes stiffer running shoes. And then they were distributed randomly to the participants. Even the researchers didn't know which participants had which shoes, the stiff or the soft. So there we go. Double blind randomization. Beautiful. So we're on the right track. And these shoes were given to 848 healthy runners. Now before they went away and they went off and ran with these shoes, they completed a treadmill test to assess their stride characteristics. And they then went home and they were monitored for six months for signs of injury. Now I'm not going to beat around the bush. I am going to be telling you the results very quickly. But before I do, I just I just want to remind you that repeated studies have shown that softer shoes result in higher impact forces. And it makes sense that when the impact forces are higher, we're going to see more injuries. But obviously that is not the case. Otherwise I probably wouldn't be making a video about it. But the results found that the runners running in the stiffer midsole shoes were 52% more likely to sustain a running injury than the runners running in the soft shoes. Okay, so remember in the beginning when they were running on the treadmill to assess their gait characteristics and everything else, they were doing that on a four sensing treadmill. And and as we already know from past studies, the runners in the softer shoes did in fact put out higher impact forces than those running in the stiffer shoes. So that's the paradox. Compelling, isn't it? And here comes the untangling of said paradox. So apparently when your foot hits the ground in your running stride, there are two distinct impacts. I didn't know that until now. The first impact is when your lower leg abruptly decelerates. So you are stepping forward, that leg swings and goes down, and it abruptly comes to a stop. That's the first impact. The second impact comes a couple of milliseconds later, and that is when the full weight of your body comes down on your leg. So your body is delivering a lot of force to your legs, which 
your leg has already sustained a lot of force by that immediate deceleration when it hits the ground. Okay, two different kinds of forces. Now that first impact, that deceleration of your leg is the impact that researchers suspect is responsible for most running injuries. I was surprised to read that too. So it's also been found that that first impact where the leg decelerates quickly is the one that has a greater impact force for runners running in softer shoes. But here's the thing, it's more than meets the eye. That greater impact force was actually an illusion. So one of the benefits of running in softer shoes is that it slows down that first initial jolt. So it spreads the force out over a larger amount of time. It actually slows down that jolt so it overlaps with the second impact of your body weight. Right? Am I making sense? I hope so. If not, look up the article. So here's the thing, the combination of those two forces makes the force of running in softer shoes appear larger. But the researcher used mathematical techniques to separate the first and the second impact into distinct values. And it was then found that the first impact, the one linked to running injuries, was actually lower in softer shoes. I don't know if that was a moment, but it seemed like it. So this is actually vindication for the people that claim that softer cushion running shoes lower the impact on your body and reduce injuries. But if you don't like doing that, get this. Running in a higher cushion shoe increases the chance that you are going to heel strike. And running in a minimalist kind of stiffer shoe increases your chances of running with a more midfoot strike. And here's the beauty. Striking midfoot also delays that initial impact force that we were talking about, where your foot decelerates quickly as it hits the ground. And that spreads out the impact forces, making a midfoot foot strike less likely to injure you than a heel strike. So here's the thing, if we can retrain our gait to midfoot strike while running a highly cushioned shoe, even though the highly cushioned shoe promotes more heel striking than lower cushioned shoes, are we really going to lower our chances of injury? I don't know. I don't know if that's how it works. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Here's the thing, retraining your gait, it's a lot of work. And going against your body's natural inclination can also result in injury. So I don't know if it's worth the risk. I'm just happy to find out that running in nice, super soft shoes is actually good for me. And I've got the science to back it up. Let's just throw another spanner in the works. What hasn't been studied is that a lot of max cushion shoes with a big stack height also now have a carbon fiber plate running right through the middle. So what does that do? I think we need more research in those fields. And of course, let me just throw my name in the hat for any running company watching this that wants to include me as a participant in one of your studies, happy to help. So even though we do have scientific evidence to support the notion that softer running shoes results in lower impact force which consequently results in fewer injuries. The researcher also points out to keep running with whatever you are happy with. He also suggests alternating shoes to vary the stress on your body. And if you are gonna change between two wildly different shoes, take time to make the transition. And ultimately, the researcher suggests to ignore everyone else's advice. He says that every runner is unique and a shoe that works for your friend or someone you see on the internet might not work for you. So with that, ignore everything I've ever told you. Hi guys, well, I had a pretty good week of running. Started off on Monday, 7.4 miles very easy. Do like my Monday easy runs. Because Tuesday, Tuesday is usually a workout day and this week was no exception. This Tuesday I warmed up for two miles, then I went out and I did 12 400 meter repeats with 400 meters recovery in between. And it was a toasty morning, but I did feel good running those intervals. I mean, it kicked my butt. I was I was pretty tired for the rest of the day, but I was happy I got it done. And then when I was done with those intervals, I was pretty close to home and pretty close to getting to the time where I had to go to work. So I only did 0.6 of a mile to cool down, which is about a kilometer. I think that's enough. And then on Wednesday, Wednesday was a day off. So I got up and I ran 10.4 miles, very easy. Right at sunrise, right at sunrise. That's the sweet spot for me for running. I like to run the bulk of my miles before the sun comes up. And then I like to be out for the sunrise. Thursday was an almost identical run, but only in the way that I got up and I ran. Just in time for me to watch the sunrise. But Thursday was a little different in that it was a workout day. Now I warmed up for three miles, then I did 7.2 miles at tempo pace. Now that was an odd number. 7.2 miles is not something that naturally comes to your mind when you're running a workout. But here was my thinking. Thursday was the 2nd of June and I knew that I warmed up for three miles and if I ran 7.2 miles at tempo and then I cooled down for three miles, which is exactly what I did, that would give me 13.2 miles, which would also get me the Strava June half marathon batch. So I had originally only planned to run 11 miles, but I got to about five miles into that tempo effort. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna run a bit longer. And I'm glad I did, because it felt pretty good. It was a beautiful day, beautiful sunrise. And I followed up that absolutely epic run with 7.3 miles, very easy on Friday. Now, Friday was supposed to be my day off, but because we had a tropical storm coming through the southern end of Florida, I knew that Saturday was gonna be really rainy in the morning, which was the only time I could run. So Saturday rolled around, and needless to say, we didn't get a drop of rain, but I still took Saturday off. And I felt pretty good about it because I, I should have taken Friday off. I was tired after that workout. So that was a nice day off, just chilling on the Peloton to get my legs spinning that day. And then Sunday, Sunday, I wrapped up the week with 7.5 miles. Super easy, but I did head over 
to the mall and ran up and down the car park just to do what I do on a Sunday, I suppose. And that brought my week's total to 54.46 miles, which is about 87.65 kilometers. So all in all, a pretty good week. Guys, don't forget to let me know about your week of running. Remember, successes and setbacks. Be kind, be happy, run well. I'll see you in a couple of days.